We gather this morning, even remotely, called forth by love to find joy and comfort in one another, to bear each other's burdens and celebrate the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. As we light this chalice, let its flame remind us of our commitment to support each other and to uphold our UU principles. Let it remind us to search for truth and meaning with freedom of thought and integrity of spirit. Let it remind us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. Let it remind us to guard against idolatries of the mind and spirit. In the light of this flame, may we be granted the serenity to accept truths revealed by science, the courage to confront questions science cannot address, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. 
There we go. This month's worship theme is wisdom. We will use the concept of wisdom as a guiding star to explore our fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Today's service starts that exploration by digging into the sometimes contentious relationship between science and religion. Our culture has come to understand science and religion as incompatible. Being Unitarian Universalists means that we don't have to choose between them. It is especially fitting that we undertake this topic today, one day after what would have been Stephen Hawking's 90th birthday. This morning's story is adapted from For the Love of Stars by Gail Forsyth Vale, found in Stories in Faith, exploring our Unitarian Universalist principles and sources through wisdom tales. Once there was a little girl named Cecilia who fell in love with the universe. When Cecilia was a small child in England, she saw a meteorite blaze across the sky. She later told a friend that from that moment, she knew she would grow up to be an astronomer. She learned the names of all the constellations in the sky. She studied the chemical elements that made up the world and learned to classify and identify plants of all kinds. She spent hours in a lab, which she called her chapel, where she conducted a little worship service of her own in awe before the magnificence of the natural world. In 1919, when Cecilia entered college, Science was not considered a proper field of study for women. Not fair, I know. But despite this, Cecilia attended lectures in physics where she found pure delight. Knowing that she was meant to be an astronomer, she persuaded the college to allow her to study physics and astronomy. After college, Cecilia figured out what stars are made of, primarily hydrogen. It was an extraordinary discovery at that time, and in recognition of her work, she was the first person ever to be granted a PhD in astronomy. Near the end of her life, Cecilia wrote that she had always been in direct touch with the fountainhead, whether you call it God or the universe. Her love for the universe and for the wonder of it all lasted her entire life. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, income inequality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate collection recipient is MUUSJN, or MUSJN, which is short for the Michigan UU Social Justice Network. MUSJN is a statewide coalition of UU congregations and our allies working together for progressive change. BUC is a member of this network with coalesces resources and expertise to support the social justice priorities of member congregations. Our donations enable MUSGEN to employ consultants to lead the coalition in various issue areas. MUSGEN has sent us a short video to tell us more about their programs. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Pulver. And I'm Mary Jo Ebert. Julia and I serve on the Michigan UU Social Justice Network Board. We represent BUC and four other congregations in the Southeast Michigan region. Uh, Moose Gin, which is how you pronounce the Michigan UU Social Justice Network acronym, is a coalition of UU congregations statewide 
who work to leverage information and resources to address social justice issues. One of the services that Moose Gin provides is monitoring legislation and sending alerts to UUs and others on our contact list, giving specifics for voicing their opinions to their elected representatives. This alleviates every congregation's social justice team from having to do this monitoring for themselves. Priority issues that Mooshin is focused on at this time include racial justice, voting rights, environmental justice, LGBTQ plus rights, access to reproductive care and economic justice. You might notice that many of these align with the priorities of our own BUC social and environmental justice program. In addition to UUs working together, our coalition joins forces with other nonprofit organizations that specialize in these areas, further extending resources and the impact that we can have together. It's also an effective way of conveying UU principles across these partnerships. The donations that BUC shares from this month's offering will be used by Moose Gin to fund consultants to lead this work through 2022. Thank you for your support. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. Offerings can be given via cash or checks by mail, by using Venmo, or online at bucmi.org. This month's offering will now be received with gratitude. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation, and we dedicate ourselves to its service. come to the time in our service that we set aside for prayer, centering, and spiritual practice. We begin, as always, with the sharing of joys and sorrows from our congregation. There were no joys or sorrows submitted this morning. However, I know that it is on everybody's minds that there has been military aggression by Russia against Ukraine and that COVID cases are rising. We know that there are many thorns that we face in life but we are also surrounded by roses and by buds. I invite you to join me now in prayer and centering. Spirit of life, mystery that animates and moves the universe, moves us. Move among us now. May we feel in our time of physical separation, the warmth and the love of this congregation. May we find hope, may we find peace, may we find warmth and love in our days. In a time that is full of anxiety, may we find a sense of spaciousness and broadness. As we come into some of the darkest and coldest times of the year, may we remember that there is yet to be a winter that was not followed by a spring. 
May we be held in comfort and in love and in care and concern, our hope for the future and in the warmth of this community. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Two weeks ago, scientists around the world mourned the passing of one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists of the 20th century, Edward O. Wilson. Wilson's ideas revolutionized the fields of evolutionary ecology, animal behavior, and psychology, but his impact extended far beyond his scientific work. Over the course of his long life, Wilson was a passionate and outspoken advocate for the conservation of natural ecosystems and the reconciliation of science and religion. Wilson grew up Southern Baptist, and he read the Bible as an adolescent. Although he eventually rejected many tenets of his childhood religion, he recognized the immense power and potential of religious belief. Wilson once said, science and religion are the two most powerful forces in the world. Having them at odds is not productive. Wilson sometimes argued with religious leaders, but he had deep respect for believers. He once said, I thought perhaps it should be recognized that religious people, including fundamentalists, are quite intelligent. Many of them are highly educated, and they should be treated with complete respect. Wilson postulated, that religious belief is itself an adaptive and evolved trait of human consciousness. He once said, the human mind evolved to believe in the gods. It did not evolve to believe in biology. Acceptance of the supernatural conveyed a great advantage throughout prehistory when the brain was evolving. This is in sharp contrast to biology, which was developed as a product of the modern age and is not underwritten by genetic algorithms. The uncomfortable truth is 
that the two beliefs are not factually compatible, end quote. In our modern world, science has become one of the most powerful forces for good and for evil, yet it remains misunderstood by much of the general public, perhaps due in part to our innate preference for supernatural explanations and mythological stories. Many people view science as a series of definitive facts that must be memorized, but this is a misinterpretation. Instead, science is a dynamic process of discovery that requires careful observation, thoughtful analysis, and meticulous experiments. No scientific truth is so set in stone that it cannot be revised in light of new evidence. Compared to the mythological explanations provided by many religions, science is a slow, painstaking way to learn about the world. However, the collaborative efforts of millions of scientists have generated an emerging understanding of the universe that would have astounded our ancestors. As Wilson once put it, by any reasonable measure of achievement, the faith of the Enlightenment thinkers in science was justified, end quote. Yet despite the immense power of science, many scientists continue to maintain religious beliefs held by their ancestors. A 2016 study found that only about 30% of US scientists saw religion and science as being in conflict. And a Pew Research poll found that about half of US scientists, including this guy, believe in God or some other form of higher power. Now you might ask, how could a rational person dedicated to the scientific enterprise believe in God? For me, the primary answer is that science is ill-equipped to answer supernatural questions. After all, what kind of experiment would you run to test for the presence of an all-powerful God? When scientists conduct an experiment, we make an implicit assumption that there are no gods, spirits, or demons messing with our results. That's why supernatural explanations are inherently outside the realm of scientific inquiry, and why science can never truly threaten people's core religious beliefs, so long as they are willing to take a figurative interpretation of religious stories that purport to explain things about the natural world. Where we do run into conflict then is when we persist in believing that mythological stories are literally true, even in the face of strong evidence to the contrary. Wilson once remarked, blind faith, no matter how passionately expressed, will not suffice. Science, for its part, will test relentlessly every assumption about the human condition." End quote. Ultimately, science challenges us to keep our minds open to new possibilities and to revise our views when presented with new evidence. I'll end with one more quote from E.O. Wilson that provides a hopeful, though tentative, vision of life after death. It often occurs to me that if, against all odds, there is a judgmental God and heaven, it will come to pass that when the pearly gates open, those who had the valor to think for themselves will be escorted to the head of the line, garlanded and given their own personal audience. May it be so. Thank you, Tom. Our second reading today is from the Reverend Robert T. Weston, who was a, uh, was a Unitarian Universalist Navy chaplain in the mid 20th century. Cherish your doubts, for doubt is the attendant of truth. Doubt is the key to the door of knowledge. It is the servant of discovery. A belief which may not be questioned binds us to error, for there is incompleteness and imperfection in every belief. Doubt is the touchstone of truth.
It is an acid which eats away the false. Let no one fear for the truth that doubt may consume it, for doubt is a testing of belief. The truth stands boldly and unafraid. It is not shaken by the testing. For truth, if it be truth, arises from the testing stronger, more secure. Those who would silence doubt are filled with fear. Their houses are built on shifting sand. But for those who fear not doubt and know its use are founded on rock, they shall walk in the light of growing knowledge. The work of their hands shall endure. Therefore, let us not fear doubt, but let us rejoice in its help. It is to the wise as a staff to the blind. Doubt is the attendant of truth. Well, I think that works out for the best. We were running kind of fast, and if there's anything people want to hear twice, it's our amazing choir, even when we're on a skeleton crew. So <laughs> thank you for your willingness to do that. Sarah, good call. Thank you. <laughs> we're all set now. Okay, great. All right. So growing up, uh, my family was very active in church. I did not wind up here by accident. Uh, it is not unusual that my family was very involved in church. It was Texas in the 80s and 90s after all. 
what I later came to realize was unique about my church experience was who else was part of my church. I didn't just grow up in Texas in the 80s and 90s. I grew up in a suburb of Houston during the height of the space shuttle program. My dad and most of the adults in my church worked for NASA or its contractors, including a couple of astronauts. The adults who taught me Sunday school were working on projects like the International Space Station and how to get to Mars. Those projects were often used as object lessons at church. Physics, computer science, and astronomy coexisted with conversations about ancient Palestine, predestination, and substitutionary atonement. Five of those things are real. We were taught to see how the mysteries of the universe could be understood from different perspectives, and those perspectives were not in conflict. For example, it was clear that the creation stories found in the book of Genesis were poetry. Structurally speaking, narrative, they're poetry. And we know that because some of our parents were astrophysicists who were obsessed with gravitational waves. The theory of general relativity is a bit more reliable than ancient cosmology. And we've learned a lot since the, that ancient cosmology. But that doesn't mean that those stories and those myths that have been passed down to us are meaningless. It just helps us find the right place for them in the realm of human existence, an inner cosmology of human thought, history, and culture, if you will. I honestly did not realize that religion and science were considered incompatible until I was a teenager. I had a deep, ongoing, slightly vitriolic feud with the fundamentalist kids at my high school for a number of reasons. Their unquestioning acceptance of religion over empirically proven facts was at the top of that list. I honestly still do not understand how they manage the cognitive dissidence of their beliefs with our very science-heavy curriculum and public culture. I could not fathom how we read the same scripture and then we came away with totally different understandings of the world and our place in it. How did we both grow up in a culture that valued curiosity, but they were militantly holding on to ancient thinking about the nature of reality? How could they shut their minds off like that? How were we ever going to get to Mars if they and others like them were stuck on the cosmology of ancient Palestine? Time went by, some things happened, I became a Unitarian Universalist. Most of you aren't here and you guys are wearing masks, so I can't really see, but I feel like what just happened was I said I became a UU, and then maybe some of you maybe have had a smile that was potentially a little bit smug, maybe, maybe. But here's the thing. I love Unitarian Universalism. I have made a life of it. I have dedicated myself to Unitarian Universalism. I chose to be here. I choose that every day. And yet, sometimes it can feel a little bit like we have a similar issue to that of the fundamentalist Christians just on the opposite side of the coin. There can be a tendency toward Unitarian Universalist exceptionalism that is not really all that attractive. And in my experience, that exceptionalism often coalesces with a condescension toward people who believe in God. More plainly put, there are those among us who think that they are better than people who believe in God or smarter. And I'm curious about the possibility of that being an overcorrection to others who think that they are better than people who do not believe in God, honestly, a trauma response. And that creates an impasse between two groups of people who are absolutely convinced that they are better than the other as a recipe for entrenchment. And I submit for your consideration that there are many uses of the word God. Language is both malleable 
and fragile. All words are symbols for concepts and they tend to fall short of fully conveying what we intend. And when we're talking about something that is as big and complex as God or the building blocks of reality, the chances that we're describing different things are really high. And the chances that we're describing them differently is also really high. Different things being described differently, no wonder that we don't understand each other. Unitarian Universalism gives us a lot of space to think and to explore. As we continue our monthly exploration of Unitarian Universalist principles, we have come to the fourth principle. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, do covenant and affirm to promote the free and responsible search for truth and meaning free and responsible. Many of us are here, there, because we are drawn by the freedom of our religion. Unitarian Universalists are not beholden to a proscribed creed or doctrine. We have the right to explore, to ask questions, and to try on a variety of theological concepts. Our third principle that we talked about five years ago last month is, that's a joke, five years ago last month, because it's been, okay. <laughs> that third principle is the acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual practices in our congregations. In our third principle, we agree to support one another's theological explorations, and in the fourth principle, we set some boundaries on how each of us will conduct that exploration freely and responsibly. The wording of our principles is very well considered. The price of freedom is always responsibility. It isn't so much that you use have the right to explore truth and meaning. It is that we are compelled to explore truth and meaning. We are not handed a set of beliefs. Rather, we are called to use the many tools that are available to us to develop our own, and that is harder than having a set of beliefs to which we subscribe. But we do have those tools available to us. We can pursue the paths of knowledge from those who came before us. We can take a deep dive into personal experience with God by following mysticism. We can consider the most cutting edge takes on theology and philosophy, hopefully those influenced by modern cosmology. And once we've figured it all out and developed our set of beliefs, we're called to keep going, to keep considering and reconsidering our personal theologies, never to be content that we have unlocked the secrets of the universe. It is the search for truth and meaning, not the finding of truth and meaning. We are a religion of questions. We came here, we stay here, because we love big questions and because we value doubt. To be in integrity with our fourth principle, we can't just pick a lane and then stay in it, stubbornly ignoring everything else. To believe that we have no intellectual or experiential limitations is in fact to limit our ability to search. It is creating a warm blanket of hubris under which we may hide and feel confident that we know all that is worth knowing. Unitarian Universalists cannot accept that. It is irresponsible to think that we have reached a definitive conclusion to a question that by definition has no conclusion. We come here to ask questions. So let's keep asking them freely and responsibly. 
Now, I worry that when I say religion and science are able to coexist, you might hear me saying, ours is a church where we believe in science. And that's true. We do believe in science. Side note, science is not something you can really believe in. It just kind of is. So yes, we accept the reality of science. And we are a church. But I think the next place that a lot of minds go is, yes, this is a church where it is OK for everyone to have different beliefs. Also true, yes. Perhaps the greater challenge that UU churches can serve is the integration of the belief in religion and the acceptance of science in each one of us. I am not saying that the goal of UU church is to make you believe in God or any particular image of God. What I'm saying is the goal of a UU church is to ask questions and to keep asking questions and to never be satisfied that you have asked all of the questions and found all of the answers. It is to embrace the healthy role of doubt. It is to be open to being wrong open to finding the edges of your beliefs and then being curious about what lies beyond them. Our goal is, that, is to know that we know that we don't know all that is out there. Even if you are convinced that there is nothing beyond what can be empirically observed, you have to know that we are yet to observe all of it. There is always something else out there. Remember, our eight principles are not a statement of belief, they are a covenant. We have agreed to affirm and promote the free and responsible search for truth and meaning in ourselves and in each other. That is the interaction of the third principle, acceptance and encouragement, and the fourth principle, free and responsible. When you find the edges of your beliefs and you see that someone else's path keeps going beyond the limit that you can travel down a certain road, you still have to respect that other person's journey. If we're being responsible, then we do not discourage or shame others for their free search. If we're being free, then we have to be open to all possibilities and not assume that something is a foregone conclusion. Doubt is the attendance, the attendant of truth. Fundamentalism is a bad look for everyone. Religion and science are not in opposition. At the risk of being reductive, it's like saying an apple negates the existence of an orange. They are different systems of thought that address some of the same questions from different equally valid perspectives. They have separate but complementary roles. They must be understood on their own terms, acknowledging that they address some of the same questions, but they are not meant to take each other's place. They belong in different spheres of human experience. Tom introduced me to Michael Dowd. He's a progressive Christian minister who is most well known for a book titled, Thank God for Evolution. Michael Dowd has called this uh, division of different realms of human experience and describing them day language and night language. When we describe the realm of physical existence, of facts, observation, and measurement, we use day language. In other words, science. Conversely, we use night language for the world of myth metaphor, story, and symbolism. Dowd notes that the behaviors and the circumstances that we find ourselves in in dreams are considered normal while we're dreaming. It's normal to dream about flying, but it would be bizarre to experience that in our waking time. He suggests that we need both day language and night language to process our existence. The two don't have to be in conflict. As an example, take the phrases sunset and sunrise. 
we know that our individual perspective is of a relatively static position on the Earth's surface. And that singular perspective combined with the rotation of the Earth causes the appearance that the sun moves in the sky. Knowing the scientific fact has not led us to throw out the terms sunset and sunrise. And it hasn't diminished the sense of wonder and awe that we feel when we watch the light fade from the, our view at night or return in the morning. People still write songs and they create art about sunrises and sunsets. If we can keep the language of reverence for the liminal experience of dawn and dusk, why not keep that reverence throughout the night? We live in a world of day language, but all of us use some kind of night language to describe the human experience. Our personal night language may be very quiet and only used internally, but it's there. We all use stories and metaphors to understand our lives. Maybe that includes God. Maybe it doesn't. Let this be a place to explore that night language freely and responsibly without pressure to abandon day language. Unitarian Universalism is a faith that acknowledges and honors the wholeness of the Earth's rotation. Let the night be the night, and the day be the day. They each have their place. They do not diminish each other. May it be so. Amen. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so, amen and blessed be.